Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Sea Outer Space Without Leaving Your Place astronomy series. My name is Justin, one of the astronomers at the Science Museum of Virginia, and I'll be your host on this flight through the universe. Now, if you're anything like me for the last few months, you haven't really left home all that often. Uh, maybe a few walks around the neighborhood, uh, a little bit of grocery shopping. Uh, so before cabin fever really sets in, uh, I thought we could plan a little trip. And uh, it's going to be a long one, so we won't be able to see everything all at once. Hope you come back for, uh, for future shows. But before we get started, just a couple of announcements. Uh, first, uh, this series is sponsored by Allianz Partners, and uh, certainly happy to have them on board. Uh, for the show, we're also going to be watching a video from the same software that we use in the dome at the Science Museum. It's planetarium software called Digistar 6, and it's capable of some pretty impressive views. So if you're able to, I recommend watching the show on a nice large monitor, uh, put the video in, in full screen mode so that uh, you can see as much as possible. I'm going to be watching right along with you, in fact, uh, and uh, I'm going to be watching on a second monitor off to the screen, so uh, I won't actually uh, be looking at the camera all that often, so you'll have to forgive me for that in advance. Um, all right, well, with that, I, I think we are just about ready to, uh, to dive in. So uh, let me actually give you a nice big video to look at. We'll switch over to the software. And uh, I guess there, there's no real better way to start than by paraphrasing Carl Sagan for a moment. And he said that the Earth is the shore of the cosmic ocean. And uh, in the real world, humans have, have only taken a, a few steps into the water. Uh, but over the course of this series, we're going to dive all the way in. Now, now the ocean is pretty deep, so uh, we're still going to take several small steps. And uh, today, we're just going to focus on the inner solar system, the objects that are closest to the Earth. And it doesn't get much closer than uh, some of the things that we have launched into space. So we'll start at the International Space Station. Right now, there are three astronauts living and working on the space station, and the station has been inhabited continuously for almost 20 years now. We'll mark that anniversary in November. Now, if I've counted correctly, 124 different uh, astronauts have stayed on the space station for long-duration missions, and then while it was still under construction, there would be regular visits from space shuttle crews, uh, things like that. Now, if you've been watching any space news recently, uh, you know that as early as next week, astronauts will begin launching to the space station from American soil once again. Uh, the last space shuttle launch was back in 2011. But through ongoing commercial partnerships between NASA and a number of companies, uh, astronauts are going to start launching from Kennedy Space Center uh, once again. Uh, the launch of the first SpaceX Crew Dragon mission with astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley on board is currently scheduled for May 27th. So we'll make sure you stay up to date on that, and uh, we'll probably have updates in next week's show. So this is as far as astronauts are journeying in the real world right now, but I'm going to take you just a little bit farther. After all, the, the space station isn't very far away. It currently orbits the Earth at an altitude of about 260 miles, or 418 kilometers. Now, if you started in Richmond, you could travel 260 miles away from the Science Museum and still be in Virginia. So space isn't that far away. Uh, so we've got a pretty long journey ahead of us, and uh, we'll meet a lot of interesting things along the way. As we drift away from the space station here, our, uh, our next encounters will be with some of the other objects that humans have launched into space. Uh, the space station isn't the only object up there. Uh, over the, the last few decades, we have launched thousands of satellites into orbit around the Earth, so I'm going to add those to the screen for you. And you'll see that they are broken up into uh, well, a couple of different groups. Uh, there are other satellites that are real close to the Earth, like the space station. These are what we call near-Earth satellites. They're, they're near-Earth orbit. Uh, then a little farther away in uh, what's called medium 
Earth orbit. There's some scattered satellites that are mostly part of things like uh, the GPS system. Uh, then a little farther away, there's that nearly unbroken ring of satellites. It actually goes right around Earth's equator. Those are geostationary satellites that take uh, 24 hours to complete one orbit around the Earth. Beyond those satellites is a stretch of space that uh, we don't use all that often, at least for our spacecraft. There are a few out here, like the one on that blue orbit. That's a spacecraft named TESS, and it's out here looking for planets going around other stars. We may talk about it a little bit more in a future episode. Uh, but for now, uh, I just want to share some of our, our natural neighbors here. Uh, in order to see the orbit of the TESS spacecraft, we had to cross the orbit of the moon. That's the line you're seeing on the screen now. And uh, I'm going to try and zoom in on the moon just a little bit, but uh, these spaceship controls are just a little bit touchy, so it might take a second. You've probably seen the moon before anyway. It's not too hard to find when it's in the nighttime sky. You can even see it during the day sometimes. So you're probably familiar with its uh, uh, mottled appearance. It's got some bright patches, some dark patches on it, which is not what you're seeing right now. This is the far side of the moon. The, the same side of the moon always faces the Earth, so that's why it always looks more or less the same when we see it in the sky. And because the same side of the moon always faces the Earth, you may be under the impression that the moon doesn't rotate. I do hear that from time to time, but the moon does rotate. How can I show that to you? Well, how do we know that the Earth rotates? Well, we see the sun rise and set in the sky every day. At night, we can watch stars move across the sky. So if the moon rotates, we should be able to see the same kinds of things. So I'm going to take you down to the surface of the moon. This is actually the, uh, uh, the Apollo 17 landing site. I have some nice hills we can look at there, but, but keep an eye on the sky. If I set time in motion, you should see some stars moving across the sky. The, the sun is up there too. That's the, that's the brightest one. It's kind of front and center on your screen. So the moon is rotating, at least with respect to the stars, and uh, it takes about one month to complete a rotation. So over the course of a month, you'd see a sunrise and a sunset, and the, the sun would begin to rise again. The only thing staying stationary in the sky is the Earth. And that is because it takes the moon about one month to orbit the Earth. And, and uh, because those two periods of time are the same, and the time it takes for the, the moon to rotate and for it to revolve around the Earth, uh, the same side of the moon always faces our planet. We always see the same side of the moon, and if you're on the near side of the moon, the Earth hangs more or less stationary in your sky. That's because the Earth and Moon have a, a shared history, and we may be able to get into that on a future episode. But uh, as we approach today's date in our uh, virtual uh, planetarium view here, I'm going to show you a brand new view of the Moon. Uh, it's uh, not just the far side of the Moon, which uh, you may have never seen before. It's a brand new map that scientists have just put together and released publicly just a few weeks ago. So we're going to jump back up into space here. And uh, well, let's see, well, let's go ahead and circle around to the far side of the Moon again. Now the far side of the Moon, as we've already seen, is covered in craters. And uh, to your eyes, those craters may all look basically the same. They're, uh, they're just little circles there. But if I zoom in just a little bit, a brand new geologic map will come into view, and the moon is going to turn some pretty interesting colors. These geologic maps may look unusual, but they're pretty useful. I like to call them paint by numbers for scientists. And uh, so instead of just uh, just coloring the moon here, uh, the, the colors here all uh, tell us a little bit different information. First, different features have been turned different colors. So the craters are colored differently from the mountains. Uh, and also, you might notice that some things that look like craters are colored differently too. So there are craters that are colored blue, there are yellow craters, there are green craters, there are brown craters. Uh, these different colors are just being used to track different ages. And we think these different craters formed at different periods during the moon's history, and so they've been marked differently on this map. So a map like this can trace not just major landforms on another world, uh, they can also trace that world's entire 
history. So, uh, so they are pretty useful. This is the first time uh, a global geologic map has been assembled for the moon like this, and it may well help plan future missions to our closest neighbor. I think it's pretty neat, but we've got a lot more destinations to see today. Hope everyone brought snacks. Uh, we're going to uh, to drift away here just a little bit and get ready to uh, to answer the first question that I posed to you when we announced the show. Ah, looks like uh, before we leave here, we've got a question about the moon. All right, first question. Um, what are some of the materials that the moon is made out of? Ah, excellent question. Well, um, we know what the moon is made out of uh, in part because, well, we, we visited there. Astronauts walked on the moon back in the late 1960s and early 70s. They brought some samples back home, and they found that moon rocks were actually very similar to, uh, to Earth rocks. So uh, you find a rock outside. It might be something like uh, what we'd find on the moon. Uh, a lot a lot of the rocks on the moon are actually volcanic in origin. Uh, the near side of the moon here, those, those dark patches of color, uh, were actually once flooded with molten rock. And that was billions of years ago. It's, it's cooled off now, uh, so, uh, so uh, it, uh, it isn't liquid anymore. Uh, but uh, uh, we, uh, because of the similarity in earth rocks and moon rocks, we think that uh, the earth and moon formed together, at least in a sense. The Earth probably formed first, but then there was a, a big uh, collision that vaporized the Earth, at least partially or, or perhaps entirely, and, and then the Moon formed out of some of that uh, that leftover debris. So uh, yeah, we'll have to we'll have to revisit the Moon again. Uh, another question from you: Is the Moon a planet? Well kind of depends on who you ask. That's uh, it's an ongoing debate in uh, the planetary science community. Uh, some planetary scientists just uh, want to look all at all of the objects that are, are shaped similarly. So, so all the objects are large enough that the gravity squishes them into a sphere and call all of those planets because they'll all behave in similar ways, uh, more or less. Others want to, to break things up a little bit more based on how they move through space. If, if something goes around a larger object, you know, d defines a moon, or we call those natural satellites sometimes, uh, and, and uh, maybe for those folks, the moon wouldn't be a planet. So it kind of depends on who you ask. But, but speaking of planets, uh, I do want to show you a few of those during this show as well. So, so we're going to zoom on out here and uh, check out what else is in the inner part of the solar system. Don't want to show you everything today. So uh, we're just going to focus on the four closest planets to the sun for a second. You're going to see the orbits of those planets uh, appearing on the screen. Uh, and I'll get them rotated around so you can see them just uh, a little bit better here in just a second. Now, uh, the, these four planets, you, you probably know them by name. We've got Mercury in there closest to the sun, uh, then Venus, Earth is third from the sun, and Mars just a little bit farther out. Now, uh, I posed a question to you in the post that announced today's show, and I hope some of you were thinking about it. Uh, what is the closest planet to the Earth? Well, looking at the screen right now, the answer is pretty obvious. Uh, Earth third from the Sun. Uh, Venus is right next door to us today. But because this video is going to be recorded and, and maybe folks will return and, I don't know, watch it months from now, it wouldn't really be fair for me to tell you that Venus is the closest planet to the Sun all the time. And that's simply not true. Each planet follows its own orbit around the Sun. They all move at different speeds. So perhaps a more interesting question is, which planet is usually closest to the Earth? Well, we can use a little bit of Digistar magic here to help us figure that out. I've got labels on all the planets to help you keep track of them. And then I'm just going to speed up time. On the right-hand screen uh, side of the screen, I've added a little bit of extra information for you. Uh, you've got the name of each planet up top, and whenever that planet is closest to the Earth, there'll be a box around that planet's name. Uh, then uh, the computer is tracking how far the planet is from Earth at any given time, and then we're building up uh, statistics down below, keeping a, a running tally of how much time that planet spends closer to the Earth. 
Now it does take a little bit of time for uh, things to, to average out. So uh, on the left hand side of the screen you can notice a couple of other things. Uh, first, the orbits of the planets are not circular. They're, they're pretty close, but, but nothing in space, uh, at least barely anything in space, moves in a perfect circle. And we call the shapes of planetary orbits ellipses. They're like stretched out ovals. Uh, it's easiest to tell on Mercury's orbit there. It's, it's pretty obviously closer to the sun on one side of its orbit than on the other side. You might also notice that all of the planets move at, at different speeds. Mercury, the closest planet to the sun, moves the fastest. And the farther out you look, the slower the planets go. Uh, these are all things that Johannes Kepler figured out uh, oh, about 400 years ago. And we call them laws of planetary motion today. All right, we've, we've just about built up uh, uh, enough uh, of, a, of an average here, so I'm going to grab a quick sip of water, and then we'll take a look at what the numbers say. All right, so on the right-hand side of the screen, you can, you can now see on the chart that well, Mercury is actually running away with the lead. And uh, over time, it looks like it's holding on to the lead, oh, about 45 to 47% of the time, much more than either Venus or Mars. So if anybody ever asks you which planet is closest to the sun, uh, excuse me, which planet is closest to the Earth, uh, your odds on favorite is going to be to say Mercury. So Mercury, usually the closest planet to the Earth, and uh, I think that qualifies as today's possibly surprising fact of the day. I'll try and have one of those for you every week. Uh, so, uh, since Mercury is usually our closest neighbor, uh, let's zoom in and take a closer look at it. So I'm going to transport you to Mercury, and there are certainly many things I could tell you about it. Uh, let's start with some basic facts and figures. We were just watching how Mercury moves around the Sun, and it takes Mercury about oh, 88 Earth days to complete one orbit around the Sun. And Mercury rotates too, and its rotation period uh, is about 58 and a half days. I'll do a little bit of math for you. If you divide the orbital period by the rotation period, that equals almost exactly 1.5. It's a very close relationship to something that astronomers call a spin orbit resonance. What does that mean in plain English? Well, might be a little bit easier if I just show you. Uh, I'm going to get rid of those numbers, and we're going to find a distinctive feature on Mercury. I found uh, a double crater that'll be pretty easy to keep an eye on. Uh, it's a little bit darker there. I'll get it kind of centered on the screen for you. But I really want you to watch the Terminator, that line that separates day and night on the surface of Mercury. I'm going to accelerate time for you, keep track of how far we've moved around the, uh, the sun at the bottom of the screen, and we'll just try and get things back to exactly the same position they were in when we started. So it's daytime at that double crater again, and Mercury's Terminator has returned to where it was when we started. Now that took us two complete orbits around the Sun, or two Mercury years. So if you lived on Mercury, uh, for you to see one full solar day, a sunrise, a sunset, and for the, uh, uh, the Sun to get ready to rise again, that would take you two Mercury years, which uh, I think is also pretty surprising. Uh, all right. Uh, I've got another question for you. We'll return to that one in just a second. Uh, I want to show you show you one more thing uh, with Mercury uh, while we're here. Uh, something else strange was happening that you uh, you may or may not have noticed. Uh, and I know that sometimes when things are moving quickly on the screen, when we're streaming live like this, it can be kind of hard to catch it. So uh, I'm going to try this little trick again. We're going to get rid of those orbit trackers. I'm just going to speed up time. Time, and we'll watch a couple of days on Mercury. But watch what happens right about now. Watch the Terminator carefully. Did anybody see it? It's going to happen again in, in just a few moments. So the Terminator will rotate around. We're going to have a sunset right there. Did anybody see how the Terminator kind of stopped moving for a second, reversed, 
and then kept moving along its usual path. Uh, this is because of that, uh, that non-circular orbit. Uh, there's a, a special meridian, a special line of longitude around Mercury, where if you lived there every morning, you'd see the sun rise once, go back down, and rise again before traveling all the way across the sky. Same thing would happen at uh, sunset. So seeing two sunrises and uh, two sunsets every day, also pretty surprising. So a lot of surprises from this one tiny planet. Uh, not too bad for the smallest official planet in our solar system. Let me give you a quick view here that shows you just how big Mercury is. Uh, I've brought along a copy of the Earth and the Moon on our journey, and I'll just add those to the screen for you to help you see how big Mercury is. All right, well, those are coming up for you. Uh, let's return to the other question we had. There's Mercury compared to the Earth and Moon, so, so not that much larger than our Moon, which is itself about a quarter the size of the Earth. All right, uh, before we move on to the next planet, we had a question from Caitlin. If uh, all of the other planets disappeared, how would that affect us? Do we need the other planets to sustain life on Earth? Well, Caitlin, uh, no. Strictly speaking, we don't really need the other planets for life on Earth. Unless you want to count the moon as a planet, the moon is pretty important to life here on Earth. Uh, it helps control the tides on Earth. That's something we can see from day to day. But over long periods of time, uh, the moon also helps make sure that uh, the Earth doesn't wobble too much on its axis. It uh, keeps our seasons fairly regular, and we don't have wild swings in, uh, in temperature from season to season here on the Earth. So uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, the others, those planets and it's not so important for life on Earth. If they all disappeared, uh, the Earth would just keep orbiting the sun uh, like it has for billions of years. And as long as we still had our moon, we wouldn't notice many changes here on Earth. Interesting question. Uh, all right, speaking of other planets, uh, I want to try and get a couple more into the show today. So uh, let's leave Mercury behind here and uh, let's go see the next planet out from the sun, currently our closest neighbor. Uh, let's go see Venus. Now, Venus is sometimes called Earth's sister planet because the two are about the same size. And if we bring that model of the Earth and Moon here to join us on Venus, uh, we'll see that, yeah, the Earth and Venus are almost exactly the same size. But that's kind of where the similarities end. We don't have so much in common with our sister planet. Uh, let's take a look at a few other vital statistics, some of the other basic numbers we were looking at before. Uh, I showed you how Mercury was moving around, gave you those numbers. So uh, here at Venus, uh, it's uh, time to orbit the Sun, its orbital period, about 225 Earth days. Now, Venus's rotational period, the, the day on Venus, is about 243 days. And there's one other strange thing. Uh, Venus is rotating backwards relative to all the other planets. And what does that look like? Well, this model compares how all four of the inner planets rotate. Earth and Mars down at the bottom rotate at about the same rate. Let's focus on the other two planets we've seen in the inner solar system so far today. Up top, there's Mercury. It is slowly rotating if you look closely, and we already saw that Mercury's rotational period is a couple of Earth months, so it should be moving slowly on your screen. Now, it may look like Venus isn't rotating at all. It is, I promise. It's just that it's rotating 243 times slower than that model of Earth is down below. So that's pretty strange. There are other, a couple of other strange things that this slow rotation and, and backwards rotation causes, but uh, I wanted to show you today something strange that Venus's atmosphere does. 
Now, the atmosphere of Venus is strange in, uh, in a number of ways. Uh, first, it's what we see when we look at Venus. It's got a very thick atmosphere that's always full of clouds. Uh, most of the atmosphere of Venus is also carbon dioxide gas, a little bit of nitrogen thrown in there too. But it's just the amount of gas here that is impressive. If we just look at the mass of the atmosphere of Venus and Earth, Venus far outpaces the Earth. So if you're on the surface of Venus, the atmospheric pressure is going to be incredibly high. And because most of the atmosphere here is carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is a heat-trapping gas, the temperature on Venus is incredibly high too. In fact, uh, Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system. But there's one other strange thing that the atmosphere does. It's a phenomena called super rotation. You can probably already guess what super rotation is. It's uh, rotating really quickly. But I just showed you that Venus rotates very slowly. So, uh, so what's going on here? Well, I can show it to you. I'm going to exaggerate the color of Venus's clouds here a little bit to make them easier for you to see. I'm also going to get rid of half of them so you can see the surface down below. Super rotation is just when the atmosphere of a planet rotates much, much faster than the planet itself. And here at Venus, the, the super rotation of the atmosphere is about 60 times faster than the rotation of the planet. And that's really strange. Uh, here on the Earth, uh, the atmosphere simply doesn't move that fast. It's actually slowed down by friction with the surface of the Earth. Uh, the Earth rotates, uh, you know, once every 24 hours or so. If you lived on the Earth's equator, that would mean you're moving at about 1,000 miles per hour. But uh, major features in the atmosphere, like uh, the, the jet stream, uh, the, the motion of the jet stream is usually in the neighborhood of 100 miles per hour. So it's much slower than the rotation of the Earth. Uh, here on, on Venus, uh, that is reversed. The planet is rotating slowly. The atmosphere rotates very quickly. Uh, clouds in Venus's atmosphere can complete a lap around the planet in just four Earth days, which again is a, a tiny fraction of one day on Venus, which is just pretty impressive. And we think we just figured out why, or at least the biggest reason why, the scientists working on Japan's Akatsuki mission uh, have found that thermal tides may be to blame. Because the planet here rotates so slowly, uh, it's daytime for a long period of time on the planet. That helps warm up on the side of the planet more than the nighttime side, and that causes the atmosphere on the daytime side to, uh, to warm up, and then it tries to rotate around to the nighttime side of the planet, as well as the poles of the planet to cool off. And because Venus just rotates so slowly, those thermal tides have really taken over and have sped up the, uh, the rotation of the planet's atmosphere. Now, before we leave Venus behind, I do want to mention some things going on on the surface as well. It'd be hard to ignore that most of this planet uh, on its surface has been shaped by volcanoes. What you're seeing now are markers that uh, mark hundreds of volcanic features on this planet. Uh, we've got big stratovolcanoes like we're used to seeing here on Earth. There are pancake-shaped volcanoes that only exist on Mercury and vast lava flows. Planetary scientists think that the surface of Venus, at least most of it, is relatively young. There's a chance that global volcanic eruptions helped resurface almost the entire planet within the last few hundred million years. That sounds like a long period of time, but compared to the age of the solar system, that's not much. And we haven't had that kind of global volcanic event here on Earth for billions of years. Uh, so, uh, so pretty impressive to see that is happening here on Venus. If you want to see a lot of volcanoes, this is definitely the place to be. Uh, but before we, uh, we end the show today, I want to show you one really impressive volcano. So we're going to visit one more planet and uh, make a visit to Mars. 
and we're going to skip over the orbit of the Earth entirely and uh, head to the fourth planet from the Sun. This is a fairly common journey for our spacecraft in the real solar system. We may uh, add a little bit of that to the show for you today as well. Uh, but first, some basic facts about Mars. As soon as we arrive, you'll probably notice its distinctive reddish color. I also want you to know that it is a little bit smaller than the Earth. If we bring that model of Earth and the Moon along, you'll see that uh, Mars kind of fits perfectly in between the two. Uh, Mars is about half the diameter of the Earth, whereas the Moon is about one quarter Earth's diameter. But we're really here to see a volcano, and I see a few here on Mars. So let's try and get a closer look. Now, there are a handful here, but I want to zoom in on this largest volcano on Mars. It's uh, the largest volcano in the solar system. It's one of the tallest mountains in the entire solar system, too. Uh, but in terms of size, I thought I'd compare it to something that is at least mildly familiar to, uh, to us here. Uh, if you transported Virginia to Mars, uh, this mountain, uh, Olympus Mons, would uh, entirely bury the state. So this is a huge mountain, a, a huge volcano. Uh, and it's uh, so tall, some 14 miles above what we call sea level on Mars, that it actually stretches most of the way above Mars's thin atmosphere. So if you want to journey to space uh, from the surface of Mars, one way to do it would be to climb to the top of this mountain. It'd be a long journey because it's like walking halfway across the state, but uh, it's something that you could do. Now, as we uh, we approached here, the, the surface of, of Mars changed a little bit. Uh, we uh, we trans uh, transitioned to some some higher resolution satellite data, and uh, so that's why Mars got a little bit darker. And so it looks like some parts of it are blinking on the screen for you a little bit. But uh, still, we'll try to fly around a little bit. We'll we'll see what we can see. Now, there's something else that uh, exists on Mars because of these giant volcanoes. I'm going to try to fly to it, but I get lost on Mars from time to time. Although it's a small planet, there's plenty of land to explore here. Uh, all of the surface of Mars is a about the same surface area as all of the continents on Earth. So you throw out the oceans and uh, it's like having all of the continents. Uh, so, so there's a lot to see here and I'm going to see if we can find a giant canyon. Looks like we have another volcano coming up here. So hopefully we're on the right path. I'm gonna rise to a slightly higher altitude to make sure I don't miss it. Now what I'm going to try to find is a canyon called Valles Marineris, or the Mariner Valley, and is a truly impressive canyon system. Might have to fly a little bit higher to make sure we don't miss it here. Uh, now, if you visited a large uh, canyon here on the Earth, uh, you know they can be pretty impressive. But uh, one of the most famous here on Earth, uh, the Grand Canyon, is, uh, despite its name, uh, not the largest canyon I could think of. Uh, let's head over here, try and get into Tabalis Marineris. That's the canyon that we're looking for. Uh, if you dropped this canyon onto the United States, at its greatest extent, this canyon would stretch all the way from uh, from Los Angeles to New York. So it is a, a pretty impressive canyon and uh, it would be interesting to explore, but uh, it's, it's not one of the things we're exploring with robots in the real universe right now. So we'll have to enjoy this brief flight through the canyon today. As I mentioned earlier, Mars is a fairly popular destination for our spacecraft in the real universe. And uh, we're exploring Mars so often for one big reason. Although this planet is a dry, cold desert today, we think there used to be a lot of liquid water here. And Valles Marineris, this canyon, may be so large because uh, it was widened by liquid water in the distant past. There's just no liquid water here today, and we aren't entirely sure why. 
We are getting closer and closer to figuring it out, though. And uh, we've got a lot of spacecraft helping us out. So let's take a quick look at one of those spacecraft. Uh, let's, uh, let's try and locate a spacecraft called MAVEN. Uh, MAVEN has been in orbit around Mars for about four years now. It is one of half a dozen spacecraft currently in orbit around Mars. Looks like we'll get there by flying straight through the planet. Don't try that at home. Um, and uh, this spacecraft is here uh, mostly to study the atmosphere of Mars. And Mars does have an atmosphere, but it's very thin. And uh, it is also uh, being bombarded with charged particles from the sun, something called the solar wind. And that happens to planets throughout the solar system. And the solar wind gets to the Earth too, but our magnetic field uh, channels it to Earth's poles. And, and we see it uh, most notice noticeably as things like the northern and southern lights, uh, the auroras here on the Earth. Now, Mars doesn't have a thick atmosphere like the Earth does, so the solar wind uh, hits the whole atmosphere of Mars, and that's actually picking the atmosphere apart molecule by molecule. And so over billions of years, the atmosphere of Mars has gotten much thinner than it once was, and that has changed uh, conditions on the surface of the planet. So perhaps Mars used to be warmer, uh, air pressure may have been higher, and that would allow liquid water to exist on the surface. If uh, we had made this journey to Mars billions of years ago, we may have seen large seas, big fluffy clouds in the atmosphere, more like we see on Earth today. Now, MAVEN is not alone. I think I already mentioned that there are several spacecraft exploring Mars today, uh, and there have been many that have explored Mars in the past. I've added a graphic around Mars, uh, a number of, uh, of circles going around the planet, and kind of like that colorful geologic map we saw on the moon, this graphic can tell us a lot of different information. Uh, each circle is a different color to signify which country has sent a mission to Mars. Uh, each circle is a, a different mission. Uh, the ones that are solid are successful missions, though not all of them are active today. Uh, the dashed lines are those that were unsuccessful. And altogether, there have been uh, all about 50 missions that have journeyed towards the Red Planet. And uh, that list is about to grow. Every, uh, every couple of years, uh, the planets Earth and Mars are, are nicely aligned in their orbits so that we can send new, uh, new uh, missions to Mars. And so this summer, uh, a handful of new missions are scheduled to launch towards Mars. Uh, NASA's next mission to Mars is a new rover uh, called Perseverance. It's going to study a region called Yezero Crater. And uh, I'll press my luck and, and we'll fly down to the surface of Mars one last time. Uh, we'll try and get a better look at Yezero crater here. Uh, let's see, should be right about here. Uh, now, Yezero crater is a region that we think used to have a lot of liquid water in it. And you may actually be able to pick out a few things liquid water may have done here. Like off in this direction, it uh, really looks like a little stream broke through the crater wall and then flowed across the surface of Mars, may have filled up this crater with water. Now, some planetary scientists think that the water was here for a long time, and so it may have created a habitable environment, a place that life may have developed. So Perseverance is going to land here in February of next year. It'll drive around. It's a rover. It'll be able to explore different regions. It'll be able to analyze the rocks in different parts of the crater. It's even going to pick up some samples that may be returned to Earth by a future mission. And perhaps the coolest part of the Perseverance mission is that's bringing a little hitchhiker along. It's carrying a helicopter named Ingenuity. 
So after the rover has landed and it's checked out its systems, uh, it'll drop off Ingenuity, and then Ingenuity should be able to fly around on its own, <laughs> kind of like we're doing now. Uh, so we may see real pictures uh, of Mars uh, from a helicopter flying around on another planet. <laughs> That'll be pretty impressive. So, so stay tuned for that. Uh, the launch of Perseverance currently scheduled for July of this year. Uh, then it takes it so about seven months to get to Mars. Uh, it should land in February of 2021. And we'll certainly keep you updated uh, as that mission progresses. Uh, so, so there you go. A whirlwind tour of the inner solar system. Uh, we started at the Earth. Uh, we saw our own moon. Uh, we visited three other planets. And uh, that's just the start. There is a lot more to see even before we leave the solar system. Uh, so I'm going to get a zoomed back out here just a little bit. And I'm uh, uh, actually keep preparing for next week's show when uh, we are going to expand our view a bit and uh, check out the outer planets in the solar system. So so that'll be next on uh, on tap for us. Uh, let's see, looks like, uh, let's see another question. I got a question from Andrea. What is the most recent planet discovered and who discovered it? Ah, well, if we're talking in our solar system, uh, the most recent planet discovered, at least among those that we still count as planets officially, uh, would be the most distant planet from the sun. That would be Neptune. Now, this is actually a little bit of a debate about who discovered it. So maybe that'll be a story for next week, too. Uh, I'll zoom us out a little bit more here so you actually see where Neptune is. It's that last orbit. I've got them in gray here. Maybe kind of uh, tough to see on your screen because we haven't explored them yet uh, during our show. So, so we'll add that to our list next week. I'll try and remember uh, uh, who discovered it. It was discovered way back in 1840. Nine. Uh, all right, and, and one final question for us today. How hot and how old is the sun? Uh, well, the sun, that star at the center of our solar system, we think it's some four and a half billion years old. You can tell its temperature just by looking at it uh, based on its color. Uh, we can do that for all of the stars and that will be covered in a future show as well. But I'll tell you, for the sun, uh, it is about oh, 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So a lot more about planets, a lot more about our sun and the other stars. There is a lot more to see. Uh, but for now, I should probably sign off for the day. I'm so glad that everyone was able to uh, to tune in. I hope you enjoyed the show, and I hope you can come back for future uh, episodes. Again, we're going to be doing these every Thursday afternoon, same time, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so I will see you next week as we explore the outer planets, and uh, I hope you have a good week. In the meantime, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you on May 28th.